This is entitled Remember the Build, and uh, the concept here is to retain the build information or realistically for the life of the project and uh, specifically for a particular version. So here's a little agenda, things as they should be. As they are, things as I think they should be. Uh, perhaps a demonstration, depends. My Windows-based laptop's been acting up. About me a little bit, 20 years software development, uh, database design. Currently, uh, lead technical developer, architect for Experian Marketing Services. Yes, it is that Experian, but I have nothing to do with the credit division, so if you're unhappy with your credit score, please don't throw tomatoes and rotten eggs. <laughs> I, I can't help you there. <clears throat> I do lead a small team of uh, developers that are kind of globally situated, most in the United States, a couple in Costa Rica, a couple in Malaysia, and a couple in Australia. We just like to keep uh, everybody working 24 hours in a row somewhere. Uh, personally, I'm not a dedicated build engineer. It's just one of the many hats I wear at work. Um, I started about 10 years or so ago now using uh, cruise control, which was the, the tool of the day back in the day. Um, I started using it on personal projects. When I got my current position at Experian, I still started using it on my personal projects. Everybody else in the group uh, was delivering software, building it on their own laptops, uh, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. When the laptops or desktops uh, failed, there goes all the work. So they saw what I was doing with this, they liked it, and they said, go ahead and do it. So I did use cruise control for about, must have been six months. Um, I then attended a, a Hudson presentation by Gosuke at Java One and changed my mind. So I gave it a try. I haven't looked back since. Um, and when it went to Jenkins, I followed. So the problem statement here, or the reason that I put together this um, little program, uh, basically the, the project managers for the groups uh, were getting emails, and they weren't very descriptive, and you click on a, a link and it doesn't really tell you much. So four or five builds into a project, they really didn't know what was going on. So. Uh, like I say, in and out of the box Jenkins build scenario and using parameterized builds, um, they're kind of lost once you deliver the email. Um, the only historical reference really is the report that the managers keep because nobody else does. Uh, data can't be reused for future projects um, and, and that sort of thing. So using the Jenkins Groovy and MySQL, I'm, I'm keeping this data and accessing it in a nice way and also presenting them with a nice report. So here, if you're using the out-of-the-box Jenkins email notification, uh, it really only runs on failures. So that's not necessarily a bad thing, um, but it doesn't give you any status. And a subsequent success if you fix the problem. A uh, failure message contains a portion of the console output Really, the, you know, the failure part, but it looks like a stack trace. So uh, project managers aren't going to want to read that either. Uh, the success message isn't much to look at. So here is a, an example success message from that. Uh, it's back to normal. This was after a failure. Gives you the name of the Jenkins project, the build number, and a URL to go, to go look at. the standard success email using an unmodified email EXT plugin, which is one of the plugins available. Uh, it's a very useful plugin, too. Um, here, however, if, if you haven't modified it and you just set it up, this is, this is also what the standard success message would look like. It uh, doesn't give you that much more information. It's not user-friendly. You click the link. Uh, that's what you get. And so people are going to tend to ignore these once they get them. It's like, okay, that, that's great. Um, if you click on that link, 
uh, you can get to the information that the user entered. So for example, um, I had them enter in this, uh, the Git branch that they're going to build and some notes if they have any. Um, well, that's, that's okay if you have a single build in a, in a version. That's generally not the case. Now, if you have multiple builds, the information isn't as easily available. Um, the user has to open each build to individually look at this information. So for example, build six and seven, you would need to click the link for build six. Read what was there, build seven. And that's, that's here. So and that would look like this. If they want to see notes for all the builds to date, they have to copy and paste if they're going to make another report. Or just again, they're going to probably ignore them. A hassle. And then again, if the build administrator has chosen to discard old builds, like you know most of us do, and limit the number of builds to keep, well, then you're not going to get any of that initial information. As far back as three or five builds is all you're going to see. So if you're working on build 20, you're not going to see what, what the user or what the developer changed on build 5. There's a better way. Wouldn't it be nice to receive this email instead? Um, it gives you the project. It gives you that, that in fact, is the artifactory snapshot version number. Uh, the branch that was built, the Jenkins build number, uh, the tagged release so that you can later check the same code out and build it, uh, the URL to the deployed application, and the notes um, running for the life of this version. I've got it set up to just show notes for a particular version. It could be for the life of the entire project, but that's, that's not practical because then you end up with four pages worth. And again, nobody will read those. Again, wouldn't it be nice to save, review, uh, reconstruct, and print the reports from any and all builds via this spiffy user interface? Um, this is actually uh, a project that I worked on and we're using it in-house right now. So this is a, a picture of some of our builds. And if clicking on any one of these tags, which is that git tag that I showed you previously, uh, will bring you to the details page where you can get many more details about the properties that were used. Uh, if, you, if you kept scrolling down, you'd find the notes and, and, and uh, uh, issues, you know, bug issues that were addressed, etc. And this is how it's done. As you can see, you can see what I watch at late night when I'm coding, uh, the things I've seen 10 to 12 times already, I, I look up from coding, laugh at the appropriate time, and go back to coding, because I already know when the jokes happen. <laughs> so, so for this demo, um, and actually in, in, in the uh, in the enterprise, I, I, these are the components that I'm using. Uh, Git, Groovy, Gradle, the three Gs, uh, Artifactory, and uh, MySQL. Now, the Gradle can be replaced with Maven or Ant or whatever other build tool you prefer. I'm, I'm migrating things towards Gradle these days. Um, using Artifactory, I suspect Nexus would be just as good. And MySQL, because it's convenient and I can uh, kick it up on any particular server really quickly. Uh, we have a need soon where we're going to be punching this out to Oracle as well. Uh, th and these Jenkins plugins, the associated Jenkins plugins that go with these main components, um, and, and they're all very good. Uh, the first five up until the email EXT plugins are the main plugins that I really use. And the rest are there for various and sundry tasks. I'm going to go a little bit over the database schema. I don't want to get into too much detail because it's rather mundane, but some of these are necessary. So, for example, for the last, for that, for this table that we're looking at here, for this information, that is the main table. The release, I just call it release candidates. Uh, it contains build tag and the version numbers. However, I don't save every single 
snapshot version in this table. This is for uh, main release versions only, 1.0s, .0s, et cetera. The snapshot versions are held in a different table, the properties table, and that table references this table. And that's how we get, uh, referentially, all of the sub-builds from this particular version that we display on that report. Um, this table also indicates if the build was promoted to staging and, uh, and or production. That's just something I keep internally. It's, it's um, just so the uh, developers, when there's a bug, they can check out the appropriate version. The sub-projects table is oh. where all of the information for a particular build or for a particular project is contained. So in this example, Hello World would be the name of the um, project. I've got the Git repo name in here. The project directory comes in handy if you have sub-projects. So I have a Gradle project. It has three or four different sub-projects underneath. Each sub-project would have a different uh, entry in this. And that is for, um, for the, the parent of the artifactor. That's where I go find the artifact after it's built, deploy it to, uh, in our case, the Tomcat server. Also, the name of the artifact ID, because it's not always the same as the project. Uh, different developers do different things. The artifact type, is, in this case, it's a war, but we also build jar files. We build zips. Um, uh, typically, those are our three big ones. But this will tell, and th that's in there so that when I am accessing Artifactory via the REST, the Artifactory REST commands, I can tell it which, which uh, file to pull, because as you know, when Maven or Gradle uh, um, do their builds, or their, they, they push them up there, they have several different files. They've got POM files, source files, Java doc files, whatever else is associated with that build. And the context path, that's valid for for uh, on the server. So when I punch it to Tomcat, it's going to be accessed using that context path. Uh, the profiles, that one's in there for Maven projects, the build tasks. That one is in there for Gradle projects. They're not often used, but they are sometimes. This, is, this has evolved. This started off at a very small table and Every developer does something different, so you know you end up adding information, and it just grows and grows. The server configurations is another table, so that I can take any one of those previous uh, sub-projects and deploy it to any one of these server configurations without modifying anything, just pulling that data from the database. So. Really, the host here is localhost, but it could be www. or something internal. Uh, that's where you could deploy to an optional port uh, for Tomcat and internal purposes, uh, the project type, and the RC type, which is really the driving factor for the servers. And those are denoted here. So one is an integration server, a production server, staging server. I use test server a lot when I'm developing these Groovy scripts, debugging them. I will run the same code to a test server just to see how it builds and deploys. Uh, that way I don't have to monkey around trying to get it to an integration server and uh, messing up somebody's test, which has happened before, and that's why test exists. The properties table contains all of those miscellaneous properties that you saw at the bottom of that one screen that will be saved for every build. So as an example, it will also save the, uh, the tag number, the, the full path of the Git repository, uh, other things such as who ran the build, um, the, the absolute location of the build. Uh, the notes, so the note in this case would be working on a thingamajig refactoring, uh, the snapshot version, and a whole host of associated properties. Whatever you want to save, you can actually put there. So it doesn't have to be anything associated with the build. You could just declare a property in your build, 
and save it. And all of these are saved into the MySQL database. Now getting to those, that's the easy part. Uh, Groovy makes it very easy to work with SQL. Um, from the Groovy script that we're going to be calling from Jenkins, all you need to do is import groovy.sql.sql, get a connection to the database, which is exactly this statement, uh, new instance, it, JDBC, whatever, whatever the name of your database is, user, password, driver, all very familiar to Java developers. Um, it's just a standard JDBC connection string. Once that's done, it comes back successfully. You have a handle to your database using the, uh, the con variable. So to run a, single, a simple single rule query, you would um, take your con variable that we just grabbed. Uh, so let's just, for example, say we're going to search for this tag because we want to check it out and make a, make a modification for it. So we'll just uh, select star from release candidates. Where it's just standard SQL. Uh, to, uh, since I'm expecting only one row from this query, I'll just use con.first row. So then we have that first row object defined in the row variable. Now to use that, we just use row.id, row.rc version, or row.tag. ID, rc version, tag are just the column names in that table. So it's just as simple as that. To run a multi-row query, on the other hand, it's just as easy. Um, instead of using First row, we just use rows. And then we just get a rows, uh, list of rows, and we can access each row in turn by using the each row iterator. So this isn't probably exactly how you would run that, but you, you get the general idea. Inserting data, that's what we're going to be doing in here also. Once we've run the build, we've created the tag, we've got all that information and the properties that we've showed you, we're just going to insert that. And um, again, it's just standard SQL, run from the Groovy script. So you get your connection, and you do con.executeinsert SQL. Now I happen to want to also get the inserted ID of that record, because I'm going to be inserting other things later. Um, you, just get a, you just do a couple of indirections, get to the head of the array, and you have your ID. And then to close your connection, it's con.close. Once I, once I saw this, I, this is actually when I got my idea. I was, running, I was working on some other project, and it mentioned Groovy SQL, so I read up about it. And I well, that's pretty simple. Maybe I could do something like that in this project. Because previously, I had been saving them in flat files, and that was a mess, quite frankly. Putting it all together. So in this example, we're just going to run through what it is like to create uh, this Jenkins job basically from scratch. So we're going to click the um, parameterize build icon. And here I'm going to add two. In practice, I probably have five or six pieces of information that I would like the users to enter. Uh, one of the m most important ones is the issue number. Um, we happen to use fog bugs. It was there before I got there, so there's not much I can do about it. But it's adequate, and it does have an API. So using the, the, the rest commands to the API, I can take the issue number that they enter and go grab the, uh, basically the title or any information out of it. But I just grab the title of the, uh, of the bug description. And then some optional notes. Really, the only one of these parameters that is mandatory is the uh, git branch. And I default it to master, as you can see, or develop, or whatever your main branch is. After you set up the parameterized build, we're going to uh, check out the code, or clone the code, from the git branch. Now, whatever SCM you use, it's a very similar operation. I'm sure there's a plugin for it. So I am, using, I am using the git plugin here. Uh, so previously, when, when the user enters their information in git branch, it will be 
were placed here in the branch specifier for the branches to build. So, so the plugin will actually check out whatever branch they enter. So if they enter in uh, bug number 22, it will check out branch uh, bug number 22 if it exists. I'm also, um, I'm also checking it out to a different subdirectory. By default, it will just check it out to workspace. And so your main, your main build file, be it build.xml or build.gradle or palm.xml, will be checked out to the, to the workspace root. I am also going to be checking out the Groovy scripts, and I keep those in a Git a separate Git repository. So I don't want them to mix and match because quite frankly, the build.gradle build scripts will overwrite each other and it's a mess. So I'm going to check out the um, project to its own subdirectory and later we'll be checking out the Groovy code. Now, now we're gonna inject the environment variables. These are, the, realistically, these are just initializers for the Groovy script. The script you, you have to be able to call it somehow. So I'm having a script directory, which is the name of the, just happens to be the name of my Groovy project. Uh, I've got the database name. That will change based on this testing that I told you about. So if I'm running a test, I'll just copy, uh, just duplicate this project, put in an underscore test, and I'm not running against the main database mucking things up. And the same with the user. Now the properties file, that's the main properties file. We're going to be passing back and forth the name of this properties file from Jenkins to Groovy, back to Jenkins, back to Groovy. And basically that's how we're passing all our variables. Realistically, we could pass all of these variables on the command line, but when you have a, a hundred or so, that's not practical. So, and here I've pretty much just described what was, what was in those. Get the right page. Uh, I'm also going to inject passwords. I don't want to um, include the password in a, either the uh, command line, like I'm doing with the rest of these properties, because quite frankly, it would be visible to end users via the logs, and it's not something I choose to do. So here, I'm just going to define the database password that will be passed to the Groovy script. Um, it will be passed, and in the logs, it'll, it'll show up as a bunch of asterisks, which is, which is fine with me. Um, in practice, um, well here, I'm just defining it locally for the, for the purposes of this demonstration, but in practice, I declared the global, uh, the global password, so it can be used by any and all Jenkins jobs. Now, the first part is to initialize the properties file with some of those properties that we just defined. Um, we're going to execute an inline Groovy script. Now, I've, in practice, since I don't do this in Windows normally, and normally I work in Linux. And I found it's much easier to do a lot of these things in Linux. But here I'm restricted to using Windows. So instead of using some, some batch commands, which I'm not all that familiar with, I just decided to do the same thing I do in Linux, which is just echo it out to a properties file, using Groovy. So, and that's sort of the uh, spirit of this talk anyway. So we're going to write these property files out to that prop file we, we described, which is juc.properties. Um, like I say, it's going to make it easier to pass the properties back and forth. So we know the name of the properties file, we know the location, and the location that I have chosen is just in the workspace root. So uh, this is actually, I didn't know if you could read some of that. It's probably a little small. So here it is, a little larger as to... Um, just how to, you know, just write the properties out to a file. It's even cleaner still using echo as a bash command, but this is acceptable. 
So we're all, then next we're going to export the job runtime parameters. And this is going to give us our build parameters that Hudson maintains, like the job name, the build number, um, the git branch, which we know anyway, uh, the user ID, the username, full name, email address, all that stuff that you've set up in Jenkins for users. So then in our build report, we can note who actually ran the build at what time and any of this other information. So this will export those parameters into yet a second uh, properties file named HudsonBuild.properties. Now, the script that I'm going to be running after this imports those properties into JUC.properties because I don't really um, want to maintain two properties files. So once it's exported and I've imported those properties, I can forget about HudsonBuild.properties. Okay. Now I will clone the Git project containing the Groovy script. This it looks like a lot of it looks like a lot of steps, but it's really not. They're, they're very small steps in the uh, Jenkins job. Here's the Windows command, um, which I'm using here, and there's the typical uh, bash command, which is just a regular Git clone wherever your uh, repository happens to be. So it's, it's much easier. You don't have to escape hash marks and all that. So this will clone uh, the JUC Groovy, which contains my Groovy scripts. It will also clone it into the workspace, but by default, git clone uses the name of the project as the subdirectory. So we will now have two subdirectories of source code in our workspace. So the reason I'm cloning it here and not from the Git plugin itself is because I have found that while you can clone multiple repositories from the Git plugin, it doesn't, it doesn't play very well if you try to put those into separate repositories. It tries to put everything into the one repository subdirectory that you wanted, which is, for my purposes, just as good as none at all. So I've chosen to um, just use it. I mean, it's a very simple command, and it gets everything done that I want. So important to keep the project separate. Yeah, it's a, it's a namespacing kind of thing, and it keeps everything where you expect it to be. Now, this is a view of the workspace up to the point what we've operated so far. You have your Groovy subdirectory containing the Groovy source scripts. Uh, you've got your Hello World, which is the project the developer works on. There's your Hudson build up properties and the JUC up properties, which is our main properties file we will be passing back and forth. Now everything seems to be initialized. Now it's time to execute the first Groovy script. Let's see if I've got... Okay, I call, this, I call the script twice. There is a switch statement at the top of the script um, with two actions. One is pre-build. Obviously, the next one is post-build. The pre-build executed prior to running my build script um, and post-build after successful completion. And that's how this is set up. So you would, you would um, invoke one of the build actions, which is execute Groovy script. I know there's also execute maven or whatever it's called. You provide the script directory, and that script directory points to that JUC Groovy subdirectory that we checked out to. Scripts, and the name of this Groovy script is JUC.Groovy. And here we're passing it these parameters. The prop file, that's that JUC properties file we're going to load. Uh, the pre-build, which is the action, that's the switch is going to take. And then the database parameters for connection. So this script, at this point, the pre-build will load the properties file. It'll query the database for the project and server information. And then it's going to save all of those, it, all of those data points back to the properties file as properties values so that the Jenkins build can then use it uh, for further processing. And here is a sample of some of the some of the properties 
that once you've finished running the pre-build, uh, is uh, what we'll be using. Most, of, a lot of this is just uh, stored from the database, using all that groovy, groovy, groovy SQL. Okay, next, once the pre-build function has finished and we return control back to Jenkins, we need to import that file back into Jenkins so that it doesn't automatically know that it, it exists, at least. So we will use the inject environment variables using the prop file, which is j, uh, joc.properties. So it will now take that, it will take these properties, import them back into Jenkins, and now Jenkins uh, can be used. They can use them such as here. Next, we're going to run the build. This is whatever build you choose to run. As you can see, uh, it's using two of the properties for this particular build, the build tasks, if there are any, and the project directory. Um, that's where the uh, build script, like I said, if there are sub-projects, that project directory will point to the root of the sub-project where, um, where the build script exists. And this, I'm going to use this plugin. It's going to do its thing. I don't have to worry about it. It's one less thing I need to maintain because this plugin does exactly what it should. Once that's through and we have a good build, now we're going to run the same Groovy script, yet we're going to call post build, which is just another switch on a string in the Groovy file. It's the same parameters as before, except with post build in place of pre build. Now this script, again, it will load the properties file because it's a second invocation of this. It's going to then get the artifact information. I said the group ID, the version, uh, in our case, the artifact or a URL to the artifact that was deployed there. It's going to create a tag based on some rules that we've set up. I think it's typically project name, version, uh, build number. Uh, we're going to aggregate the notes from previous builds. So if this is build 5, it, this post build will go out and say, okay, I know this is build 5. Let's get the notes from the first four builds and add the notes from build 5 to that. It's going to create the HTML elements to use in a report. So if you've got five builds worth of notes and or other types of properties, it will just create uh, list objects. You know, just it'll just surround them with li tags. Basically, that's that's all that's doing. Um, it'll create and push the new uh, branch to Git using that created tag that we had, so it's available to the developers in the future. And it will append these new properties, which which are the group ID and the version and the artifact URL that they're they're uh, getting. It will append those back to the properties file because those are going to be used and the report. Post build actions. Well, that was a post build action. She could have renamed that. <laughs> so after the, the build and the post build Groovy script, there are still other uh, actions that we'd like to take. Um, well, such as deploying the artifact to Tomcat, or JBoss, I've actually also deployed to Glassfish. Um, and then you want to send the email. There could be other tasks that you want to do. This is the place to put them. However, at this point, the Groovy script, the, all the Groovy processing has been completed. So now we're just, we're, we're moving on to regular Jenkins functionality and plugin functionality. So for deploy to Tomcat, uh, for this example, I just used the, uh, deploy to a container plugin. However, I don't use this um, it, in the enterprise because it doesn't, from my experience, at, at least unless they've updated it, it doesn't recognize the environment variables imported into Jenkins. So for example, you have to hard code the path to the war. You have to hard code the context path, um, which I suppose would be fine, but this Groovy script that I'm using, I am currently using this for at least 10 separate projects. Script as is unmodified. 
So when I set up a new project and they, and they want this type of email stuff, um, I just, just call the same script, pass it different parameters, um, and it's happy. Uh, in the enterprise, what I do is I have a library written to access Tomcat using the Tomcat manager. And that's just a, it's not even a REST call. I'm just using curl. So as an example, how easy it is to execute. And this is in the build script, by the way. Well, it's in a different library. But if I, weren't, if I wasn't doing this here, in my normal build scripts, this would be in the post build actions near the end to deploy to Tomcat, pretty much at the same spot it is now. But you just, uh, you just run your curl command, which is you know, the Linux thing. And in Windows, I, I wouldn't know what to do, to tell you the truth. <laughs> um, but you just create your command string uh, file, the at path, the dollar sign path there points to your artifact, so your war file, wherever it is out there. Um, the context is the path in Tomcat the context you want to deploy to, uh, and there we go. And, and the rest of these properties would also be loaded dynamically, such as localhost, for this localhost would be a property from the file. The port number would be a property from the file. So, so most of this would be variables that are, that are being substituted here. And then to just execute, it's just curl.execute, and then the dot .text just returns the response from the curl command. And so if it's a success, well, if it starts with OK, we're good. If it doesn't, it didn't deploy for some reason. But this is good because it's just using the Tomcat manager. So I found that's better than just copying the war file or removing the war file and copying it, because then you have to worry about, has, has the war file completely undeployed before you deploy the next one? And um, this is a lot simpler. Let Tomcat do the work. Now, for the uh, piece de resistance, uh, which is the basis for all this, is a, is a nicely formatted email report that contains useful information for those that are receiving it. Uh, the email ext plugin, it has a good ability to use the imported environment variables, unlike the Tomcat plugin. Um, Using the HTML content type enables the use of straight HTML in the, in the um, template. And the dynamic portions of the email are populated using the properties that we generated uh, in the Groovy script and imported. So here is an example, the editable email notification. This is the default content. This is pushed out whether it's a, a build success or a build failure. Um, this is kind of the information we'd like to know. You can see the default subject also contains these property values. Uh, and then it's just straight HTML with some property value substitutions. And it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you can also use CSS, as I, as I did at the top of the, uh, actually, right there at the top is a little CSS type style tag. So you can style the output of your uh, report however you like. This is the uh, success block. So here's your default block. If the build is a success, this will be appended at the bottom of that template. And this is just going to contain the URL to the deployed artifact, uh, the user notes if they exist, or the list of user notes from all previous builds. Um, and then any other information, we have quite a significant selection on some of ours. Demonstration. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. I have not had much success getting it to run under Windows. It's been quite slow. So let's see what we have. Make sure this is running. Here's the current state of the application. Well, that didn't go well. Probably want to start the server. Good old demos. All right, let's see if that works.
Okay, so basically just hello world. That's, that's all we're trying to do here. Now let's go into the code, the uh, project code, which is hello servlet. This is quite simple. We're just gonna make a change. Hello world from JUC with an extra two exclamation points. We will save that. I think I've got that up and running. All right. Oh, yeah, that's right. Didn't like that. Well, that part might not work. Oh, I got a typo? Oh, thank you. Well, there we go. <laughs> All right, now we'll commit this. Make sure you got that right. Okay. Now. We've committed our change. Let's run our project. In fact, let's, I'm gonna show you where all of these items are. So pretty much it's, it's, it's just as I showed you in the, oh, I didn't like that. One thing I would like is if Jenkins would uh, properly size some of these elements. So here's your parameters, the um, user input parameters. Here's the git where I'm checking out the project directory. I'm checking it out using the git branch. I'm still gonna use master. I could change that. Um, the hello world, that's where the directory it checks out to. Delete the workspace, I always like to do that. Uh, the artifactory plugin. So when this is through building, it will save the war and all the associated paraphernalia to Artifactory for future processing. I'm gonna inject the environment variables, uh, the name of the prop file, inject the password for the database, in initialize my property files, export the runtime, which is the Hudson build properties, uh, check out my groovy code, Run the pre-build. Now you notice, th here I'm checking out the Groovy script file because it's an external script, whereas here I'm just running a straight Groovy command, just inline command, because it's easier that way. This, this Groovy script, by the way, is, is not there. I'll potch it up later. Um, then you, uh, yeah. you run your pre-build, you inject the properties files, you run your Gradle build, run the post build, inject them again. Here we go with the uh, Tomcat, your email notification. I almost run this. The problem I've had with this is on Windows, it's slow. All right, we'll just run that build. Oh, that's all. Okay, well, we we'll, might just cut it. Oh, that was the old build, wasn't it? There we go. Well, we might cut it. And if not, I have a backup plan. So this will... And this is the part where it's a Windows thing. On Linux, this thing is done chop, chop. Um, I don't know why it's taken so long at this stage, and it, and it has since I've put this thing together. What's going to happen here is it's going to build, it's going to kick off that email, and it's going to send me something that looks like this. So you will get all that information in fact, if, if, if the regular email would come in, the bottom uh, would be build 13 or 11 or whatever we're on with uh, the text that I just changed. 
um, a code change, which is much nicer to look at. And so you will also be able to click on the URL, which you can do, and it will take you right to the application. So this is good for project managers or anybody else that's monitoring the status of this build. Um, are there any questions in the, in the minute that I have left? If, um, if, if you want any further questions or if you want me to supply some of this code for you, please email me. Um, it's, you can always email me here. at robert.mcnulty at experian.com, and I will send you this demonstration code with any other explanations that you might require. So if there's no questions, let's get back to that beer. Thank you. <laughs>